All right, people, so welcome to biology. So we're starting our new unit here with ecology, but here's a little throwback to classification. So if two organism, uh, organisms are in the same order, what other taxon must they also be in? So again, that kind of concept of like the funneling down. If you're in the same order, then you have to be in the same domain, kingdom, phylum, class, and then order. So just make sure you've got that written down somewhere since this will be an open notes test. And then number two, this was the trickier one uh, that some of you guys uh, messed up on on the practice. Which pair of organisms are more related? Well, just looking at the species names, like we don't have pictures of them, right? But you can kind of guess what the frog is. Um, these two are the ones that are more related because they're in the same genus. Whereas Rana and Canis, even though they're both lupus, they're actually probably vastly different organisms. Like we have no idea. Like this is a wolf. And if we know Rana is a genus of frogs, then this would just be a frog. Maybe this is like a wolf frog, right? So it's just a coincidence that they are both lupus. So you gotta be, gotta go in order uh, of the taxa. All right, so you guys should kind of like ecology. A lot of this stuff you'll probably know from just watching TV, all these species interactions and like food webs and trophic levels. So this should go pretty quick. Um, the kind of main species interactions, so how like species interact with each other. So like between different species or within a species, we call that like intraspecies. So like competition. Um, predation, herbivory, symbiosis, living together. There's different types of living together. Um, so that's what we're going to look at today. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, so when we're competing with other organisms, um, you know, humans, we, we have uh, pretty much taken over, right? We, we take away resources of a lot of other creatures out there. So food, space, water, shelter, sunlight. Um, we compete with each other for mates, right? So this would be an intra-specific type of competition. Um, but this can happen between species, so interspecies or intraspecies, so uh, within a species group. So when you're competing, everybody loses, right? Because uh, you have to, uh, you're, you're giving up. Nobody's getting all the resources, uh, if you want to think of it like that way. So how do you limit the amount of competition so you're not like fighting with other species or fighting within species too much? Um, this idea of resource partitioning. So if you look at like birds, birds are pretty sneaky. Even on the same tree, they've pretty much divided up the resources of the tree. Like some organisms will start eating from the top and going down. You've got uh, woodpeckers that might dig deeply, woodpeckers that don't dig as deep. You've got birds that start at the bottom and go up. Some birds, different species will just be eating food off of the ground. Um, they uh, live in different parts of the trees. You'll see these teeny tiny little, they're called uh, kinglets. They'll be like bouncing around at the very tippy tops of trees. Um, they, they will live in different species of trees as well. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so we call this resource partitioning. They also do it, you know, not like even just physically by location. They'll do it by uh, phenology. So like by time as well. So you have one species active at night and then another species active at day in the same forest and so that would be like the difference between barred owls and like red tailed hawks they eat the same thing they're pretty much competing with each other but they don't have to compete with each other if they're active at different times of the day so kind of a cool cool idea to limit competition all right so uh predation is the one that uh is probably the easiest species inter species interaction right so you have predators and you've got prey the predator is captured and killing the prey which costs energy to do uh, the prey tries to run away right or hide there's lots of different um excuse me there's lots of different uh techniques um adaptations to avoid being eaten uh what you guys one of your videos will watch is the cool kung fu pantis so check this one out um it's literally a, a type of praying mantis that will do a type of kung fu to uh scare off a spider so this one's like pretty pretty fascinating it's a thriller um so what's actually really interesting you probably don't notice is uh, predators really only eat a, a certain number of prey. It's it's rare for a predator to eat like lots of different species of organisms. Really like humans are the only ones that do that. Um, if we look at like a food web, and we'll show that in a second, um, you'll see there's there's usually not too many lines going to or away from uh, a, an organism. Um, so it, they're usually species specific because they've adapted to hunt like just certain animals. Their, their search image is like very specific. Um, what's cool about predator and prey populations is um, you, you can 
pretty much predict what's going to happen to the prey if you know what happens to the predator and vice versa. So here's like hair versus linked. So the prey here is the blue. So if there's a lot of prey, you kind of get this delay. Well, that means there's going to be a lot of food for the predators. And so their population will go up. But if their population is going up, then that's going to cause, oh, the population of prey to go down. It's just kind of this back and forth, back and forth. And so you get this kind of like time delay between predators and prey. Um, Isle Royale has this kind of uh, population of wolves and moose that have been isolated on an island in Lake Superior, and they have the same exact curve. When the wolves go up, the moose go down. When the wolves go down, because there's not enough moose, well, then the moose will go up. And so it's just back and forth, back and forth. Um, so here's some of those adaptations I was talking about. Defenses, you know, camouflage or cryptic coloration. Mimicry, this is actually just a worm that it raises its butt up. This is the butt end, but it looks like a snake, so it'll scare off birds coming in. Uh, and then warning coloration to say, ooh, I am uh, poisonous or I'm toxic, don't eat me. What's kind of funny is there's some cheaters out there. So monarch butterflies are the ones that are actually like more toxic and not um, like tasty for birds. But the viceroy butterfly has ended up mimicking the monarch butterfly. This one is actually really tasty. Birds could eat this without getting an upset tummy uh, if they if they knew it, but it scares them away because they look like the monarchs. So kind of tricky. Um, so here's another example of mullerian uh, mimicry. Um, I believe, oh shoot, I forget, I have to look this up. I'll put a little note in here. I think it's the Madagascar ones that are not poisonous, um, but these ones are. And they're separate, look how far separated they are, but they've ended up mimicking each other because uh, for whatever reason, uh, organisms are, are fearing this blue color because they think it means like poison. All right, so you got a lot of videos to watch today, but they're all like basically a minute long. So check them out. There's a really interesting uh, example of herbivory. And then here's a kind of cool one, uh, how plants have like triggered uh, lizards to come and eat the insects that are covering them. So this is, these are pretty fascinating. So check out these videos. Um, they're, they're pretty short. Oop. Went too fast here. Um, what we didn't talk too much about was coevolution. I mentioned this before, how species, since they, when they live uh, in very close proximity to another one or um, are just integrated like this, they'll actually start to mimic traits in one another. Um, so you can see this, you know, fly. We looked at it with hummingbirds, but, you know, its, its tongue is going to match exactly its source of, of food so it can get the nectar at the bottom of here. Um, check out this bird, right, that beak to get to the nectar down here. Um, this owl is perfectly matching the places it hides out in, so this like species of tree. So coevolution, they're kind of evolving together, um, which is interesting. So we can kind of think of it as an arms race between predator and prey. Uh, in this case, one's neither like net predator or prey, right? It can happen with like symbiosis when organisms are living together. So this always reminds me of that old school Michael Jordan, Mia Hamm uh, commercial they used to do back in the day. Anything you can do, I can do better. So they're always going back and forth. And here's an awesome example. This one is a really long video. You do not have to watch this one, but it's fascinating. Uh, this guy uh, used to be an uh, economist, but he started studying uh, ants. So check this out if you're really interested. If you're getting bored during quarantine. All right, so here's probably the new stuff for you um, as far as ecology, a term called trophic levels. So when we're looking at food webs, we're looking at how um, like energy matter is moving through a through a community and a community is like, you know, a bunch of different species living in the same area. Um, so that's what we're really looking at here. So we kind of draw it like a pyramid, right? You've got your producers at the bottom, your herbivores, your carnivores, and then your apex predators on top and kind of omnivores sit in any way between. Uh, these arrows going down would be all those detritivores or decomposers, those recyclers. So whether it's like bacteria or just like vultures or something like that to recycle it all back in so it can all start over again. But notice what you're, you're seeing right here as you're going up this is the flow of energy right because everyone's eating energy but notice it's a pyramid right these groups are getting smaller and smaller so as uh, every time it's going through a level, you're actually losing some energy because everything is not efficient. Um, having to catch food, having to digest food, having to eat food and break all that down wastes a lot of energy. Um, and so we'll see what's going to come up. It's called the law of 10%. So here's just kind of a bigger food web. Uh, this is with... Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, this is with uh, aquatic species, but it's the same idea, right? It, it happens everywhere in nature. So you got your producers, also known as autotrophs, self-feeders, 
primary consumers would be those organisms that eat producers. We, we kind of call them herbivores, but our fancy term is a primary consumer. They're the first heterotrophs, right? They're eating other organisms, so heterotrophs. And then secondary consumers would eat primarily primary consumers. So like we would call them carnivores. Um, they could also be considered omnivores as well. Omnivores kind of sit in everywhere. Um, so if primary consumers are deer, then wolves would be like the secondary consumer. And then tertiary is if you keep going up, right? A fourth level, those are the ones that are eating uh, the third level. Um, so how many how many steps is it taking? So each step would you just add another level? And this is actually pretty rare. We, we don't get that many tertiary and I'll show you why in a second. Um, and then I already mentioned, oh, there we go. Let's get this guy running. Little rocket raccoon. Omnivores fit kind of at multiple levels because they, they eat anything. They're very much generalist. They're not as specific as other organisms. Um, and I've already mentioned the decomposers, but you know, we don't give them enough credit. If we didn't have decomposers, like life would pretty much stop, you know, relatively quickly. You have to be able to break down and release all these um, macromolecules in, a, in an organism once it dies so other things can use it. So uh, check that out. This is actually an optional video if you want to watch a monitor lizard get decomposed. Um, go for it. Click on that. But there you go. Um, so that reason why it's kind of a pyramid shape is because it's the law of 10%. Uh, each level only contains 10% of the energy from the level below. Low it, which is a lot less right so let's say uh, a grass here was uh, has an energy level of like a hundred calories right calories a unit of energy well the grasshoppers eating that grass is only going to get 10 percent of that actual energy to put towards its body mass because um, it's going to waste a lot of energy like hopping around on the grass it's going to waste energy digesting it it's going to waste energy assimilating it so making the grass a part of its body and it loses a lot through metabolism and heat so it's it's really only incorporating 10%. So if this was like a thousand calories, it's only got a hundred calories from it. And then if the rodent eats the grasshopper, well, a hundred, 10% of that would be 10. And then the hawk is only going to get 10% of that. And so you get this like small pyramid, right? You're getting less and less as you go up. So that's why populations of hawks are a lot smaller than a population of a rodent. There are less rodents than grasshoppers and less grasshoppers than grass. And that's why there's always like more producers, more plants on earth than anything else. It's this law of 10% that is like, like losing energy. We're so inefficient. So here's just kind of a definition of it. And so this brings up the idea of, all right, a vegetarian has a smaller ecological footprint. Cause if you take like a hundred pounds of grain, you could feed more people, uh, like humans with it in, uh, instead of like feeding that hundred pounds to cows, then the cows would only incorporate 10 pounds of that into steak. So you see, it's like crunched down. Um, so you can feed more people. Um, if you eat lower on the food chain, um, if you're eating higher on the food chain, you're actually, you're like having, you're having a bigger footprint because you have to think about, all right, what did those creatures eat to get big? Right? So it's like this kind of weird extended concept. All right. This stuff, feel free to read through. It's pretty straightforward. Food webs, food chains, right? Again, notice that you don't have really that many arrows. Um, like tertiaries just don't happen that often because of uh, how how little um, uh, energy gets passed up the food chain. So um, check out that. But we've done competition, we've done predation, herb, herbivory. The other types of uh, species interactions would be symbiosis. And so there's three types of those to get through. And you also will watch uh, videos and kind of each of these. So mutualism is the first where two species, basically this is the I scratch your back, you scratch my back situation where uh, both species are helping each other out. So like microbes in our digestive tract, they're helping to break down foods we don't normally uh, can break down. So like uh, uh, fibers and stuff like that in our uh, large intestine, uh, it does create gas in us, but it helps us out, gives us nutrients and vitamins, and those microbes get all the food coming in. Um, plants with nitrogen cycling, pollination is the big one, right? So all those organisms living together and helping each other out. Uh, here's some other ones. You'll watch a video on some examples of these, you know, Nemo living with the anemones. This bird, why doesn't the crocodile just eat it? Well, because the bird's actually picking and cleaning its teeth. So it's, it's, they're helping each other out here. Uh, this is the boxing, uh, crab. It's got anemones as little boxing gloves, which is cool. Um, another one, this is the hardest one. 
this is where I right, two species are living together. One's benefiting, and the other one just it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really care. And so uh, facilitation is a big example of this. This is like kind of hard to f find in nature, but like a big tree, it's creating shade for other organisms. It doesn't really care if organisms are hanging out underneath it, right? So those organisms are benefiting. The tree really isn't. But you could say, all right, if they're hanging underneath it, maybe they're gonna like defecate and provide uh, some uh, fertilizer. So that might actually make it mutualism. So this one's kind of hard. This is like one's happy, one's like meh, doesn't really matter. Um, so same with these. These birds follow cattle around because they're gonna eat the insects that get popped up as the cattle are walking around. But you know, the cattle doesn't really care about the birds being there. All right, the last one real quick, because I'm running out of time, is parasitism. Symbiosis, again, two things living together. And so you've got parasites where obviously they're going to benefit, but it's actually hurting their host organism. Sometimes it kills the host. Usually it doesn't because the parasite wants to keep eating them. So there's lots of examples on there. I'll write in some more information here, and you're going to watch a pretty gross one about roundworms and leeches. So that's it. That's all I got for you.